Jewish state and Zionism. It has been a long time since Christians should not be taught and told anymore on why the Jewish state is legitimate in the light of the prophecies. Unfortunately, this is still necessary because the false Christian doctrines, which attempt to substitute for Israel in spirit, represent such a proportion of the Christian world that one still cannot neglect these groups of people and we must continue to fight for their sake in order to open their eyes. But among those who accept the prophecies, the question often arises as to what kind of prophecy allows a country visibly as depraved as the modern Zionist state to still exist. How can we consider a state which is one of the most atheistic and the most soiled by all sorts of sins to be the fulfillment of biblical prophecies in accordance with the will of the Almighty. The question is indeed legitimate, and if we are in the spirit and we look at Eretz, we quickly realize that no real feeling of spiritual catartism is gaining our souls, but on the contrary. Who owns the Holy Land? It is crucial to note that the exclusive owner of the Holy Land is Yahuwah himself, and not the Jewish people, or more broadly the Israelites, or any other people. This is the only piece of land where, from the beginning, the Lord of this world, Satan, has no right of disposal. And it pleased Yahuwah to have reserved this land for the chosen people from the beginning until the end of time. When from time to time against his original will he is forced to exile his disobedient sons, the country temporarily finds itself in the hands of other nations. Zionism Tivadar Herzl or, or Theodor Herzl a German-speaking journalist of Hungarian Jewish origins, born in the vicinity of the Great Synagogue of Dohain Street in Budapest, but living in Vienna and working for a Viennese newspaper, was on assignment in Paris when the famous Dreyfus affair was taking place. He saw the officer Dreyfus, accused of treason, being stripped of his post and rank in public, when his sword was broken in two. Herzl was shocked when he saw a panting crowd gathered at the scene and shouting, Death to the Jew! Herzl was amazed that barely a century after the French Revolution and the proclamation of the human rights, the French people were still at this level of primitivism. As it later turned out, the culprits were Dreyfus' senior Christian French officers and the French army's secret documents were handed over the German officers to a Hungarian aristocrat called Count Esterhazy. They were the traitors who chose a Jew as their scapegoat. It was the vision of Dreyfus' humiliation and the rage of the people that gave birth to the concept of the modern Jewish state in the mind of Tivadar Herzl in Paris at this precise moment in history. He realized that we need a country when we enjoy self-determination, where we can defend ourselves with arms and live in peace with one another. Zionism from Herzl to this day has always been traditionally atheistic and socialist. This is mainly an initiative coming from mostly assimilated and non-believing Jews who felt in this Europe of before the pogroms and the Holocaust that something very unhealthy was in preparation and that the time had come to leave and return to our ancestral homeland. This eventually came to fruition a bit late, in 1948, when the State of Israel was finally proclaimed. Anti-Zionists 
Many know that the world's greatest anti-Zionists are often Jews, and those who officially count as Jews by blood are fierce enemies of the Jewish state. For example, George Soros or George Soros, proclaimed persona non grata in Israel, an desirable person, because being a supporter and declared financer of Arab terrorist groups, he was also used as a detection dog during his teenage years by the Nazis in Budapest under the war. He helped his Nazi masters to expropriate the valuables left in the apartments by the Jews who had been deported. See the interview video on this subject available on YouTube where he himself explains and confesses his past almost with pride. And there is another form of Jewish anti-Zionism, which is not based on atheism, but on the contrary, takes its roots in religious extremism. Here too it is the Hungarian form of Jewish orthodoxy that stands out from the crowd and which is the fiercest opponent to Zionism. The orthodox curant of Sotmar, from the Hungarian region of the same name, fundamentally refuses to allow anyone to establish a Jewish state in the Holy Land. For them, only the Messiah has the power to bring the state of Israel back to life. Until then, no Jew has the right to do so. However, the return of the Jews to the Holy Land is also, according to them, authorized and even recommanded. These ones work in favor of the prophecy of the return as well, but in a different way, completely neglecting the political and administrative side of the issue. They are the ones who enjoy the security system, military protection and social benefits of the Zionist state, but who refuse to contribute to it, to work or to serve in the military. Or rather, it is their wives who they send out to work for them, because a man naturally has to study the text from morning to night according to the Talmudic laws. During this time, they expect their wives to go and earn their common bread while managing to maintain a clean and decent household and to take care of their 5 to 13 children per family on average. That said, this illegitimate and infamous way of life is widespread among all currents of Jewish orthodoxy, not only among the Satmar. But Satmar orthodoxy is the most famous and the most prevalent current in the world. They mainly inhabit the cities of Antwerp, New York and Jerusalem. Within this orthodoxy developed the current of Naturae Carta, the defenders of the city, who do not limit themselves to peaceful resistance, but militate violently against the state of Israel. They are the ones who dressed in Palestinian flags are burning Israeli flags while themselves funding Arab terrorist groups that shed Jewish blood and they often appear alongside the leaders of Israel's main enemies. They are the ones who indirectly commit fratricide, thus violating a law much more fundamental than the one of the prohibition of establishing a Jewish state in place of the Messiah. These ones are vulgar murderers who according to our common laws and their rabbinical ones at the same time deserve immediate death by stoning. They are naturally all the more blind to this obvious fact as their extreme Talmudic delusions surpasses the average of those from the other religious movements. An Orthodox, worthy of the name and in harmony with himself, if there is one, only allows himself to profess his anti-Zionist views in a downward and moderate manner. A Jew worthy of the name will never make a pact with the enemy and criticize his brothers in public or incite his hatred and destruction. And if he feels the urge to burn an Israeli flag, he will do it at home with his family, behind the curtains and not in the streets before the eyes of the whole world. Order or promise of return 
this chaotic situation, where it is humanly very difficult to say who is right, among the Jewish parties, of course, must be seen from the point of view of Yahuwah, because all of them are touching directly or indirectly fundamental truths coming from Yahuwah, and most of the parties have a good excuse for the, I would say, deviant Zionist behavior. According to the will of Yahuwah, and following the destruction of the sanctuary around 17 BC, the Jewish people began the longest exile in its history, which lasts to this day. However, according to the prophecies, the people must return to their original homeland before the return of the Messiah. Here we have to do with a people who have fallen into two extremes. Some have abandoned the practice of their religion, and they are angry with their Creator for not understanding how He allowed them to suffer so much. They have often chosen to abandon their identity, which they consider to be the source and the cause of all their troubles. On the other hand, we find Jews who follow religious precepts to the letter, these precepts which may be based on the Torah, the revealed word of Yahuwah, but have been greatly deviated from it by a multitude of superfluous and human teachings. It is precisely these distorted teachings and precepts that constitute the veil which has come to cover their hearts and eyes and that prevents them from recognizing the Messiah in Yahushua. Among them, the persecutions and sufferings endured over the centuries only increased their religious fundamentalism in order to regain the sympathy of Elohim. He is the community's brainy, like the Smurf wearing glasses in the Belgian cartoon, the one who even does what is not expected of him in order to please the Papa Smurf. It is he who will continue to wear a strimal and a very black kaftan, a fur hat and a long black tunic, even after having left his cold Russian steppes and having lived for a long time under the blazing sun of the Middle East. Because he is persuaded to do the right thing by afflicting himself that way, because this is what the great wises of Israel asked him to do 150 years earlier, and no one has yet seen fit to modify the decrees and to adapt them to the current situation. And we could enumerate the many absurdities which are still contained in the rabbinical literature. Nevertheless, his devotion remains touching, for he is convinced that this is how he pleases the Father. So it is clear that no one of the parties are no longer fulfilling the original role, identity and path that Elohim assigned them, especially since the Messiah was not recognized in Yahushua. Yet the promise, the commandment, the prophecy of the return to the Holy Land at some point is still valid, for the rejection of the people has never and will never occur. See Romans 11, if it is still necessary to draw your attention to this. So for a better understanding of the situation, let's now imagine a father being forced to kick his sons out of the house because they are unable to obey the rules. Then, before letting them go, he orders them to return home before sunset because danger is approaching. So the sons may wander all day long, some of them going even further from the precepts of the father, and others trying to guard them with increasingly delusional and unnecessary zeal. Neither really comes back to the word of the father, but both feel the danger of night coming and hurry to get back home. Which according to his own atheistic or fundamental religious motives and intentions, but the important thing is that they all come back. Even if they do not so with proper repentance, the main thing is that they remain alive and safe from the danger of the dark. Israel, as a secular state, 
which in many ways is also influenced by totally antichrist forces, at least has the advantage of reuniting the flock before it gets lost forever. Thus, Yahuwah allows this gathering take place temporarily under foreign flags, such as the socialist and atheist Zionism. So for those who criticize the secularism of Israel, rightly do so, but they simply have no vision that the return to Eretz could not happen otherwise in the case of many, many Jews. And instead of criticizing, you should rejoice, for lack of anything else, to at least see this law fulfilled, that of returning to the Promised Land. But those who accept Israel, on the other hand, often fall into the other extreme. These many times fall into the sin of idolatry of the Jew or that of the fulfillment of the prophecies. And even if they do not consciously accept the sins, they still tolerate them by casting the veil on the sins of Israel. Instead of remedying them by exposing sins and by announcing the path to healing which is Christ the Messiah, they simply remain silent. So this ostrich-like approach of the issue only makes the situation worse. And the religious Jewish community will one day have to realize that most of their secular brethren did not give up their faith simply because of anti-Semitism. Many have been dissuaded from remaining in the faith because of the visibly human Talmudic doctrines and laws which are inherently very foreign to the original Jewish mentality. A sober and reasonable Jew will never fall into orthodoxy and this is not a question of faith. He would rather go and win Nobel Prizes or, in the worst case, found banks. Anyone who has an idea of the things of Yahuwah will soon realize that Rabbinical Judaism is filled with both intellectually and spiritually unacceptable doctrines, laws and demands. And since there is no other alternative to remaining Jewish, many prefer to go out into the wilderness of the world and use their talents to succeed in life and survive the best they can. Their goal will be to ensure the best possible education for their children so that they too can survive in a world which is completely alien and hostile to them. Money does not buy happiness, but it is often a great help and a means of survival. This view is humanly understandable, and the leaders of the current Zionist state operate on this principle. As long as there is enough money and weapons, everything is fine. These are their idols for now. The Palestinian question According to some, it seems that there are no Palestinian people today. But that's not the question. They might very well exist, better be the direct descendants of the ancient Philistines, then they would remain just as alien to the Holy Land as they were originally. The Philistines, their alleged ancestors, have themselves always been intruders and usurpers whose presence in the Holy Land and hostility to the Jews was a direct consequence of the sin of Israel. So I don't really understand the debate, and above all, I don't understand why no one preaches this fundamental truth instead of discussing and explaining historical things unnecessarily. Or rather, yes, the Palestinians have indeed existed since Roman times, when the desire of Rome of Israel to be de-Judaized went so far as to rename the Holy Land Palestine and the Jews who live there Palestinians. The 1930s encyclopedias defined the Jewish settlers as being Palestinians, and the accompanying flag of Palestine was essentially the same as today's Israeli flag, a white background with a blue star of David in the middle. So if you wish, the Palestinians still exist. That has been one of our nicknames for over 2,000 years. But from the perspective of Arabs called Palestinians, 
It is the story of the Canaanites, not that of the Philistines, that is much more interesting. As it is clear from the story of Rahab, at the time of the first conquest, that the former tenants of the promised land were also not very happy to see the Israelite people arrive. However, from Rahab's words, we know that the Israelites' arrival and intention to take possession of the land did not come upon them unexpectedly. The people heard of the arrival of the Jews and were afraid, as we read in Joshua chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. I know that Yahuwah has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. So you see, many people still invest in real estate today. They buy flats in the city centers while their children are still minors, allowing them to later have a place to live and start their adult life. Until then, They rent the apartments to amortize their investment, but also so that the property is maintained and does not lie follow. So the same sort of thing happens with the Holy Land. Then Yahuwah spoke. He put on the hearts of the Canaanites that the time had come. They certainly did not get the message just when the time came, when the Jews were already surrounding Jericho but their ancestors must have already been told deep down in their souls. Certainly all generations of Canaanites have always felt that this land was not theirs, but that they could use it for some time. They must have felt like foreigners from the start. Then, when the time came for the landlord to hand over the property to his own grown children, The tenants reacted in different ways, and many of them rebelled. Nothing has changed since. Yahuwah does not reject the Arabs. The promise of Hagar and Ishmael, to the extent that today's Arabs are their descendants, is just as valid as the promises made to Israel. Remember that we are not a privileged people, but simply a chosen one. We have been selected, set aside, or sanctified for service, for the service of others, and not the other way around. However, we also have the right to housing, the right to have a country somewhere in the world. In a broader sense, and in the Messiah in Christ, we also look forward to Arabs in the extended family, especially since these ones are also our relatives by blood. Yahuwah does not cruelly throw people into the street. Most Canaanites must have been settled further afield, where having merged with the local population, their present descendants are part of the Arab world. They do live, but only elsewhere, differently, maybe better, in a place where they can truly feel at home. Perhaps today's wealthy Arabs living from petrol are precisely the descendants of these obedient ancient Canaanites who accepted to leave the country. Who knows? But the Arab group known as Palestinians from the 1940s to the present day, having inhabited the Holy Land for the past few centuries, would also certainly have received a new home if they had obeyed. But ultimately, Even those who left to settle in Jordan continue to claim their rights in the Holy Land and are only waiting for the green light from the states of the world to regain possession of what they believe to be theirs. Thus, they put themselves under a terrible curse and are in great danger because of their perseverance not to return what is not theirs. The feeling of forgiveness and resignation must be sown in them, and the conviction that if Yahuwah takes something away, he always gives something else instead, something much better, much better for them. There is no doubt that the spirit of Yahuwah has walked before the Jewish settlers from the late 19th century until the founding of the state in 1946, 
and to the present day. Thus, the ethnic groups who lived there, like the Canaanites of the time, were given the ultimatum to return the country and pass it, not to the Jews, but to its sole rightful owner, Yahuwah, who wanted it to serve as a home for the Jewish people. Elohim has no intention of throwing and sweeping up anyone. He could have blessed these people who caused so much troubles in the world and give them a new homeland. If they had obeyed, they would have recovered abundantly elsewhere what they have lost here. The time has come and the Jew must return home for the prophecies of the gathering to be fulfilled in preparation for the Messiah's return. Anyone who fights against this project puts himself in danger of death. The Israeli army, on the other hand, did not seize the opportunity 40 or 50 years ago when it would not have bothered anyone in the world except the Arabs themselves to expel all the Arabs from the territory of Israel while there was still time. And this is precisely what represents this thorn which makes us suffer a little more every day. Today, the world expects us to ask their forgiveness for everything, almost even when we happen to manage avoiding their stabs. Taking up arms against them after years of provocation and missiles fired against the Jews has become a sacrilege that most nations condemn. Those nations that have become so insanely blind. This is where we are today. However, I do not deny that some Arabs are sometimes subjected to inappropriate treatment. After all, in a situation of war, anyone can go wild, anytime, and an Israeli soldier can behave in inhuman ways too. However, this does not excuse the illegitimate presence and rebellious attitude of the Arabs in the territory, so that the subsequent excesses of the Jewish soldiers while often reprehensible, do not justify their alleged rights. Furthermore, one who incessantly provokes should not be surprised at the defensive response in return. Pointing fingers after lightning the fire is a particularly vile and cynical behavior, especially coming from a people who deliberately position their bases and weapons under hospitals and schools, and then accuse the Israeli army of killing innocent children and old people when this one comes to destroy in order to defend itself and prevent future atrocities. Moreover, a humanity whose mind is based on an excessive and disproportionate humanism will never understand how the one who is visibly stronger can be right in the face of the one who seems utterly helpless. Elohim would have blessed them in abundance elsewhere, where the Arabs already live, somewhere in the millions of square miles that represents the Arab world. And if my sentence make you smile, check for yourself. 8,171,000 square miles is the area of the Arab world from Morocco to the Iranian border, from the Mediterranean coasts to the border of Black Africa. Some would say that much of this land is an uninhabitable desert. Whose fault is it? The Holy Land was also a dust bowl before the Jews arrived. Jews have almost miraculously turned much of the region into a thriving oasis. Indeed, with an appropriate lifestyle and willingness to work and not just to go out to graze the goats and sheep, which will eventually digest until the last blade of grass, man is able to restore and maintain a healthy and green environment. I think it is useless to discuss the petty and greedy character of this spirit which stubbornly refuses this small parcel of land of an insignificant size to a people who have nowhere to go for 2,000 years and who stupidly protects a so-called disadvantaged minority. 
The present land area of Israel is 13,050 square miles. Here live 6 million Jews and 3 million Arabs. And should we still share such a tiny territory? Knowing that the number of official Jews still dispersed in the world is 12 million additional souls, not counting the descendants of the lost tribes not yet gathered, or the lost members of the tribe of Judah who are assimilated and whose gathering is also ongoing. When a large-scale reunification according to the biblical promises will finally occur, we risk feeling more like sardines in a can than Jews on a promised land. In such case, the Arabs who still insist on staying will finally flee only because of the smell. False Jews and real Khazars, or vice versa. Our basic right to the land stems from the fact that we consider ourselves to be the descendants of Jacob, primarily his sons Judah and Benjamin. However, according to some theories, the Jewish mass of Central Europe is not from Jacob, but descends from the Khazars who converted to Judaism. In another article, I will expand on this topic a little more detail. But very briefly, there are three possibilities, none of which can be excluded. The first is that the theory is wrong and that we all come from Jacob and thus from Judah. The other is that only the ruling Khazar class converted to Judaism, as many Jews and non-Jewish historians claim. And the third case, often accepted by Jews themselves, historians and geneticists, is that the theory is absolutely correct and that the Jews of Poland, Hungary, Germany, Ukraine, Romania, etc. right up to the Ural Mountains are largely the descendants of these proselyte Khazars. And here, generally we stop reasoning. Suddenly the challenged Jews remain silent and prefer to turn the page and not to examine this delicate subject in more depth. However, the territory of the ancient Khazar lies a few hundred kilometers northeast of the Kingdom of Israel. What a coincidence! This is indeed the exact direction in which the ten tribes were deported. You see, it is always very suspicious when someone feels such a deep attraction to the Jewish people that they have an overwhelming urge to convert to Judaism. This is not what happens in the vast majority of cases. Contact with Jews actually generates something other than attraction. Hatred, contempt and hostility are the feelings that our presence generates in the hearts of the nations and certainly not any form of sympathy or appeal. The relationship of the nations with the Jews does not generally reflect the attitude of the Khazars, but rather that of the Cossacks. In many cases, attraction begins when similar genes come into contact with each other. This is a bit what John the Baptist, Johannan, must have felt in his mother's womb when Miriam or Mary visited Elizabeth his mother with Yahushua in her womb when he started to jump for joy. You know, this thing was not revealed to me. It is not a prophetic vision, but a simple human reasoning, almost mathematical. But I have the strong feeling that if the Khazar theory turns out to be true, it would also turn out that the Khazars, at least a large part of them, were none other than the descendants of the ten deported tribes. This is how the prophecy of the gathering would be fulfilled, not in the last days, as it is understood today, but in the last days, as presented by Yahoshua as having already begun during his life on earth. The gathering of the lost tribes would therefore have been ongoing for almost 2,000 years. Also see my article named The Gathering of the Tribes of Israel. 
So today's Ashkenazi Jews would only have to be revealed which tribe they really come from. Until now, we thought that we were descending from Judah, Benjamin, Shimeon and Levi since these four remained. But it may soon turn out that many of us who wish we were Rachel's son will have to accept that we are not even descending from Leah, but possibly from one of the latter's two maids. The functioning of El Shaddai in the territory of present-day Israel. Anyone who still has doubts that the present state of Israel has anything to do with long-standing written biblical prophecies, just go and see the media and the accounts of the people living there. How many true miracles the Jews of Israel have witnessed since the founding of the state? Let's take only the most common case, rockets fired from Gaza. An incredible amount of rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel since the early 2000s. They should have claimed huge numbers of lives. However, the number of injuries and deaths and even property damage is so low compared to the number of shells that to attribute it to chance would not even sound like a bad joke. So despite the appearance and the will of the majority wanting to portray the modern Philistines as little Davids against the great ugly Goliath that the Israeli army is supposed to represent, the story however remains the same as it was during Saul's reign. Israel may have a huge strike force, be the most formidable army in the world, the giant is not the less the so-called Philistine with his billions of Muslim brothers behind to support him, without counting the formerly Christian nations having renounced to their faith and increasingly relying behind the enemies of the Jewish nation. The modern David still manages to defend himself by his own power against Goliath, his enemies. But soon, the time will come when, like the original David, he will defeat the enemy once and for all, but only trusting in Yahuwah of hosts in El Shaddai. The role of Israel in the last days. This is the gathering place of the Jews, where the true identity of the Messiah will be collectively revealed to them, where they are going to mourn him as one mourns a firstborn, on the day of the final Yom Kippur. The state of Israel will also be the headquarters of the Antichrist, for there will be built the last temple, which will become the throne of the Antichrist. This temple perhaps already exists, perhaps it is this underground synagogue already present under the Temple Mount, who knows. There, the religions of the world will be unified, while Jerusalem, the indivisible city according to Yahuwah, will be divided into two or three parts. This is where the image of the beast will be erected and before which almost all knees will be forced to bow as in Daniel's time. Israel is also the place where the nations of the world will come together to try to eliminate the Jewish people at Har Megiddo or Armageddon and where Gog and Magog will do the same 1,000 years later at the end of the millennium. Jerusalem is also the city where the two witnesses are to be put to death before they resurrect and return to heaven. It would take far too long to list all the events that could not come about without the return of the Jewish people to the Holy Land. But let no one imagine that the return of the Jewish people to the Holy Land must take place in the greatest harmony and understanding between peoples having regard for all religious traditions of the region. Because all childbirth is accompanied by pain. The prophecies do not announce or promise any such thing. What is written is that we must return and take back possession of the land, whether some people like it or not. Just like during the time of the first conquest with Joshua, 
Yahushua. Whoever does not manage to disregard his humanistic feelings and human justice falls into the trap set by the enemy to make him rebel against the will and plan of Yahuwah. Such mistake acts like a poison blocking Christendom and preventing it from fulfilling its essential role alongside the Jews in the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end times, in which they should have played one of the main roles. Regarding the pro-Jewish Christian minority, these words should also urge caution because each trap has its double, its antithesis, its other extreme, which is often even more dangerous than the first because it works in the name of love and tolerance. Do not defend everything on the pretext that the thing bears the stamp of Jew. The poison is just as present there and can paralyze you in your calling as it is in the case of your Judeo-skeptical brothers.